Welcome to the latest episode of Close Readings. This series we've called The Long and Short, because in it we're looking at a selection of modern long poems and short stories, modern meaning in this case from about the middle part of the 19th century onwards. And as always, our conversation will be informed by the great archive of essays and reviews and other pieces that make up the back catalogue of the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry, and I teach English at Balliol College in Oxford, and I'm talking to Mark Ford, poet, critic, and professor of English at University College London. And today, we are going to be talking about an extraordinary long poem, uh, some couple of hundred pages long, though they are generously spaced pages, called Gaudete, or pronounced in some other ways, by Ted Hughes. So, Mark, this is, I suppose, not the most well-known of Hughes's works, uh, but should it be better known? I think so. I think it is the weirdest poem by a very, very weird poet. Um, and um, Hughes was the poet laureate, and in some ways he came to sort of incarnate notions of what poetry should be about, um, um, very different from his sort of antagonist, Philip Larkin, say, who covers a different sort of sphere of, of post-war British poetry. But Hughes had an enormous following and became the Poet Laureate. So there's a there's a sense in which one can forget how utterly bizarre much of his poetry is. And Gaudete is one of the strangest of all his poems. And it has a very sort of interesting genesis uh, in his own life. In some ways, it can be seen as the poem that sort of makes possible what was his best-selling volume, Birthday Letters, which came mm. out just before he died before in he died. Uh, 1998. But the poems with which Gaudete concludes were his first explorations of writing a kind of elegiac poetry, uh, commemorating the series of deaths in the wake of which Gaudete was kind of conceived and then composed. So it was started in the wake of Sylvia Plath's death in 1963, initially as a film script, uh, which he hoped to interest Ingmar Bergman in. I mean, I, th mm. I think it might have appealed to Bergman in which you get a similar balance between or tension between erotic exuberance and kind of repression, which you get in Gaudete. But then Bergman never saw it. It didn't happen. He forgot about it. Then he picked it up in 1969 after Asia Wevel, who was his, the person with whom he had an affair which triggered uh, his split with Plath after she committed suicide. And shortly after that, his mother died. And Susan Alliston, who was another girlfriend of his from uh, from the early 60s, died. And it is a poem which is about kind of preapism, you could say, mm. erotic excess uh, in a kind of melodramatic way. And also in a very mythical way, though. It's yeah. it's a kind of mixture. I, I we, We've both written about Hughes for the LRB. And um, I was struck by your phrase, exuberant recklessness. Uh -huh which seemed to me to capture a lot of what's one way of characterising this poem. Yes, and as you say, uh, its origins most implausibly in a film scenario, and that has quite important consequences for its style, doesn't it? Because it's all written in this very striking present tense narrative as if it's describing a series of camera shots and it has no dialogue for example so it's as if he's describing scenes for which someone has yet to supply the dialogue that the actors might use and the whole thing has this rather kind of nerve-wracking present tense kind of quality um it's very striking as a piece of writing isn't it just stylistically as a piece of writing yes i mean it is an experiment for hughes um, i mean he wrote a lot of radio plays and you can see the the ways in which uh, it's the kind of antithesis of his radio plays in the in that it's uh, as you say it's very visual and uh, Seamus Heaney actually compared it to Whitman. <laughs> uh, Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hugh sent it to Heaney and he said, that, you know, there's Whitmanish long lines. Mm. And it, it is astonishingly uninhibited mm. in terms of readers or listeners who are new to this. They will be um, struck by how in some ways it reads like what a 15 year old might write, that, that Hughes uh, has found a way of, of writing in this extremely visceral way way which describes action and men looking at people through the scopes of rifles and things like that and when you explain the plot you say well it's about the uh, women's institute but it's not like the women's institute as you know it involves human sacrifice and dressing up in stags costumes and antlers and kind of group sex and and um they sort of think 
this is either kind of completely crazy or completely brilliant. I think it's both. Mm. Uh, I think in an odd sort of way, the genre, if it can be that, that, that Hughes invents for this, allowed him free access to the, his id, <laughs> which he is never that kind of restrained. But it, he's moving on from Crow, uh, which came out in 1970, a kind of long, long poem, uh, which again is exploring in some ways the dreadfulness of modern civilization, which is again a, a point that you make in your piece on on Hughes in the LRB, the extent to which his whole poetic oeuvre was a kind of attempt to dismantle the Enlightenment. That's a big, a big project. Yeah. But the extent to which salvation, and in this he's following D.H. Lawrence, salvation requires somehow connecting with these primitive pagan energies and releasing them and somehow uniting the body and the soul, however that can be done. So it, to that extent, it, it does belong to that line of English writing that goes back through through Lawrence to Blake and to medieval writing as well, which celebrates a, a kind of paganism and sees Christianity, though <laughs> the preapic vicar, Lum, he's not the vicar as the Church of England would approve. I mean, to give our readers a sense of the actual Yes, we basic, should say something about the plot. The, the basic Don A, um, in terms of the main body of it, is it's this, this vicar who convinces all the women in this small Yorkshire village. That well, it's, it's, the, it's more peculiar than that, isn't it? It's the changeling of the vicar. It is. I mean, there's this who, prologue, mm. which is incredibly peculiar. Which is very hard to construe. But you do a very good job in your piece. I mean, not to mutually flatter each other <laughs> for the entire hour, but you do a very good job of explaining what's happening in that prologue. And, and, and the demonic forces, as I think is what Hughes calls them, construct, as it were, a new Reverend Nicholas Lum, uh, an odd name, which we might come back to, uh, a new uh, Reverend Nicholas Lum out of an oak or some other similar yes, uh, sacred tree. The and, trunk it's, and, the it, tree. And, it, and it's the replacement it's the changeling vicar who comes back and then starts screwing everything in sight in, in this village, <laughs> this rather well-to-do village by the sound of it. Uh, that's Yorkshire. a really important point that there are two lums, you know, there are there are two of them. And this goes back to Hughes's own sense of doubleness, that, yep. that he had a kind of doubled consciousness after the death of Plath, that somehow right. that he was divided or, or had become completely alienated from himself in some way. So the lum who, who has sex with all the women in the village is actually the changeling who is created by this log oak log being whipped yeah, yeah. Uh, so violence is is the portal it, yes. i mean the violence actually also includes him standing under uh, a bull who has its um, belly ripped and all the innards plunge upon him and he fights in the kind of roping mess of blood so the kind of initiation <laughs> To reach the, the main body of the story it is extremely violent and confusing and perplexing. And there's, it's an apocalyptic scenario, lots of dead bodies everywhere. Yes, yes, the dead lying in the street and for some un, unexplained historical reason. And then, as you say, we get into the main plot, which is, as you say, about this changeling Church of England <laughs> vicar who seduces everything female that's moving around in the in the village. I mean, there, and there also, we should say, interspersed with this, there are weird phantasmagoric um, episodes Episodes, aren't there where in one of them for example Lum thinks that he meets uh, all of the women of the village buried up to their neck in mud um, around a crater into which he descends and and fights a strange, horrific, bestial, furry creature uh, before coming back to uh, what you might think of as the real world again. Um, and there are other similarly kind of fantastic and mad kind of subjective um, episodes. But then the climax of the whole thing is that the, the blokes of the village, the chaps, all finally get together because they've been shown photographs by this uh, resourceful and crafty a bloke called Garton, who's a poacher, really, who, who's taken some candid snaps of what's been going on, both in people's bedrooms, but also in the Women's Institute, where the women all meet. Um, and the men storm uh, the basement of the church where, where the ceremony is happening and, and kill him off. Well, he's actually picked off by a rifle shot, isn't he? Uh, yes, he, he does a brilliant, there's a brilliant run scene, isn't <laughs> yes. there, at the end, where he's running away as fast as he possibly can. I mean, it, it is this, I mean, the Donne is this weird fusion of the archers with with, you know, the Euripides back eye. It well, is, exactly. And they're my, my nan, the women are kind of my nads in some ways. They it's, are kind it, of terrifying. It is the scene of an Agatha Christie novel, isn't it? Or, or Midsummer Murders, as I was saying to you earlier on. Fused with these pagan rituals. Yeah, and yeah, that, and yeah, something yeah. like The Wicker Man, which plugs into a similar kind of sense of the pagan that's underlying the, the veneers of civilization um, of kind of 60s and 70s England. So... 
they all think that one of them is going to give birth to the Messiah. They don't know which one it is going to be. Uh, and Lum is indefatigable. I and mean, he's getting a bit tired by the end of it. And this does, of course, match on to Hughes's own how to put it, preapic aspects of his life that he would be juggling different women, uh, such as in the late 60s, Asia, Brenda and Carol, and he calls them ABC in his diary. <laughs> and um, uh, there's a sense in which the polygamous, which is what is released uh, when uh, the pagan <laughs> is released, um, is here somehow allowed full reign, but also chastised by the narrative that he does die uh, or suffer extreme amounts of violence. So I wouldn't call it a morality tale exactly, but on one level, it does show the dangers of erotic excess, uh, which were dangers which, which Hughes experienced himself. And some of the, the late lyrics with which it ends seem to meditate upon some of the consequences of his behaviour. Just taking up the, the idea that it might in some sense be a morality tale, even if that's not all it is, and perhaps taking it in a, in a rather solemn way just for a second, which isn't our fullest impression of the poem, it's obviously saying something about Christianity, isn't it? And something that Hughes uh, says elsewhere about the, about the limits of Christianity as a way of explaining human experience or human history. Mrs. Evans, who's one of the many women who <laughs> the Reverend Nicholas Lum seduces, after her husband has discovered this, thanks to Garton's crafty photography, and then a very brutal scene where he hits her repeatedly. Yes. I mean, it's a really horrible scene of, of Mrs. Evans being beaten up by her brutal blacksmith husband. Mrs. Evans then, one imagines, with her lips swollen and blood on her forehead, he, she explains what Mr. Lum has come to say. She says, Mr. Lum has a new religion. He is starting Christianity all over again, right from the start. He has persuaded all the women in the parish. Only women can belong to it. They are all in it. And he makes love to them all, all the time. Because a, <laughs> because a saviour is to be born in the village, and Mr. Lum is to be the earthly father. And this drives um, Mr. Evans into a, a fit of you know, renewed violence and anger, this time against poor old Garden, who just provided the photograph. And obviously, at some level, I, I, I suppose I'm thinking about the tone of the poem in a way. This is sort of funny and odd, isn't it? But at the same time, there's something about it that Hughes absolutely subscribes to. He thinks that Christianity is just the wrong metaphysic for human life. Thanks for listening to this extract from The Long and Short a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription, go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.